Jim, thank you for taking the time today. I've been following you for quite some time on Twitter and I'm really grateful to have brought you on today. Thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me, Danny. How are you? I'm absolutely wonderful now that I'm in your presence, although I'm, you know, (laughs) battling a bit of a cold, but it is what it is. But I'd like to start with you and I'd like to start with your grandfather and a keg in the woods. What ah, was that wow. story all about? Okay, you're getting bonus points. That's the first time anyone opened with that question. I Okay. Um, so my grandfather was born in 1885 in Stillwater, Minnesota. He was the, the 13th child, Irish Catholics. Um, and uh, so they gave him the name of the saint of the day, which happened to be Ignatius Aloysius, uh, something he really didn't like later in life. All of his friends called him Naish. Anyway, my great grandparents uh, were very successful bootmakers. Uh, Stillwater, Minnesota was a logging town. And um, so they made sure that all of their kids went to college. And if you think about it, Back then, that was like crazy. Um, So my granddad got accepted at a college called St. John's University, uh, which is in a place, a little tiny place called Collegeville, Minnesota, Um, and uh, went up. And uh, he was a a bit of a hellraiser, to be really honest. And uh, he got caught having a keg in the woods, in the middle of the winter, I might add, in January, uh, with his friends during a prayer service that they call Vespers. I'm, I, Catholicism didn't take with me, so I, I, I know some of it. But uh, anyway, uh, got called in to the headmaster who immediately expelled him and expelled his friends as well. So my grandfather was like, this is bad. <laughs> what am I going to tell my mom and dad? Uh, I better have a diff- I better have a position at a different college before I even tell my mom and dad. Now remember, there are no iPhones, there are no there are no public phones. So he would like literally have to take a train down to Stillwater and, and tell them in person. So anyway, he decided uh, he had heard of a college called the College of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, and so he decided he was gonna go and seek admission there. So he got there, um, bitterly cold. I don't know if you've ever been to Minnesota, but if this were the old USSR, that's where we would send all the dissidents. Um, Anyway, uh, he sees a priest walking down uh, the sidewalk. He stops him and he says, excuse me, Father, could you tell me where the president's office is? And the priest looks at him and "Why? why do you want to know? And my granddad said, I'm seeking admission here. Priest looks at him and he goes, son, uh, this isn't the admission uh, period. Uh, That was in the fall. You know, why why are you seeking admission here now? And my grandfather said, well, because I was at St. John's. They uh, kicked me out. Really? Why'd they kick you out? I had a keg in the woods during Vespers. Really? Do you think it was fair of them to kick you out? My grandfather looks at him dead in the eye and says, absolutely. I knew the rule. I broke it. They didn't have a choice. Well, I, I, our family also has a, a ton of luck in it. <laughs> the, the, the man that he stopped was the president of the university who admitted him on the spot. What my granddad did not know was that his buddies, who also had been expelled, beat him to St. Thomas and also got an audience with the president. But they all were, it was totally unfair you know, we, they should have given us a warning. We didn't know. They offered excuse after excuse after excuse. None of them got in. My grandfather offered no excuses, said, yep, I knew the penalty. I had to pay it. Um, and so my grandfather went on to be one of the most successful Irish Catholics in the country. He was an oil wildcatter and, and kind of did a Gates Buffett before Gates and Buffett brought it up. Uh, During his own lifetime, he gave away about 95% of his own fortune, uh, which I'm immensely proud of. 
um, he used to say that uh, money was like manure. If you piled it all in one place, it stunk to high heaven. But if you spread it around, it was a great fertilizer. Um, so um, <laughs> my grandfather was uh, captain of the football team at St. Thomas, and uh, they were the recipient of uh, his thanks. If you, if you go to the University of St. Thomas, you will uh, see quite a few O'Shaughnessy uh, buildings. Um, and he helped uh, uh, put them on the map as it's an excellent, uh, I wouldn't even say regional university now. They've really, really done incredibly well. He also helped Notre Dame and others. But I guess that the message of my grandfather for me um, was, A, I was super lucky to be the youngest grandchild, male grandchild. I have a, a, a cousin who's a few months younger than I am. Uh, but that lived in St. Paul, where my grandfather lived. And when my grandmother died, my grandfather started coming over to our house for dinner like twice a week. And so literally he would sit and talk to me and you know, tell me about his exploits, which were like amazing. I, at some point I'd love to either write a book about him or make a movie about him because he was an amazing guy. Um, but also he taught me so much about, you know, how to conduct yourself. Um, you know, your, your reputation is what you are, right? And if, if you're not distinctive and if you're not always there, people are going to notice. And uh, even though I also say, you know, people get all worked up about thinking about what other people think about them. They're not really thinking of me at all. So, <laughs> But anyway, very, very proud of him. Uh, he, he served as an incredible example for me and for my extended family. Um, and, uh, you know, how, how, how to do that stuff well. Uh, back when, you know, it was new back then. Uh, a, a lot of the folks, you know, you had Andrew Carnegie giving all the libraries, which I think is great. Um, and, and, and other of the so-called robber barons. Uh, but uh, this idea of like giving almost all of it away uh, was was pretty radical for the time, and and many of his business associates were like, "You're crazy, man." <laughs> what inspired him to do that? So, my grandfather was an incredibly intelligent guy who thought about things a lot. As a matter of fact, I can't, I can't assert this with 100% certainty because I don't have a copy, uh, but a friend of mine um, who saw Napoleon Hill's first volume of Think and Grow Rich uh, said my grandfather's in the book that, wow. Napoleon, that Napoleon Hill had uh, interviewed him. Again, I, I, can't, I can't say that with certainty because I'm still looking for, for an original copy. To, to confirm it, but so my, my grandfather was very thoughtful about the way he did things and the way he treated people. I'll give you a couple examples. So um, back when he was uh, one of the biggest refiners um, in the country, um, everyone else was trying to unionize. And uh, everyone came to my grandfather and said, right, what are you going to do about the unions? My grandfather said, what unions? And, and they were like, they're not trying to unionize. He goes, no, if you pay, if you treat a man fairly and you pay a man a fair wage, he's not going to try to unionize. Hmm. And um, so he was like really insightful. I'm, I, you know, it wasn't like he was this super forward guy. He was pretty conservative in many, many aspects. Uh but he also taught me something that I used from you know a young age on, and I has been amazingly helpful uh, for for my own career. And that's this idea of what my grandfather called premeditating. And what he meant by that was, first off, he would say, "Think about what you want, then try to write it down." And he goes, "If you can't," express clearly in what you're writing, what you think you want, you don't understand what you want, and you maybe don't even want it. But then as you do this, 
what I want you to do is think about all the various pathways to get to where you want and write those down too. And, and then he said, what you're going to find is that for a certain percentage of the things that you think you want, you actually don't want them. And he goes, this exercise will help you understand that. Um, and he goes, the other thing that's very helpful is, he goes, ideas love to bump into each other. And he goes, and wonder of wonders, they generate three new ideas. Uh, so he was kind of like a, he was really big on, you know, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a human Monte Carlo simulation, uh, but uh, done in a very different and intentional way. So uh, it, it, I wrote a piece and put it up on Twitter called The Thinker and the Prover um, that makes use of some of these ideas. It just helped me so unbelievably much in, in my, both my career, uh, being a dad, uh, being a husband, you know, trying to be a good member of the community. Um, and it's, it's really powerful when you can express very simply either what, what you want to achieve, what you want to make happen, uh, but also what you don't want to happen, right? I see, I mean, I, I try to work a lot with younger people, not just in finance. Um, and, and I just see like this, this that they're, they're wound pretty tight. And, and man, I get it. If I, if I was 28 and social media, I'm sure I would have been like absolutely off the reservation. And and so I understand that young people today, you know, face kind of a, an environment that I simply was, didn't have to face. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that I say is, you know, you're, you're your brand. <laughs> Find something where you're going to add value, be, be of use to people. And, you know, wonder of wonders, people are going to really love you. And, and, and it's hard because... You know, people get very self-conscious and, and, and whatnot about what other people think about them. And, you know, maybe that was one of the greatest realizations I ever came to uh, when I was kind of in my mid thirties, which is people aren't thinking about me at all. And, and, and so that, that made me relax quite a bit in terms of, you know, not really caring too, too much uh, what, what others um, had to say about me. Well, now, you know, I also, as my friend Trent Griffith uh, made me understand, I didn't understand this before he taught me this. So I think, you know, it's always great to learn something new every day. Um, and, and, and Trent was like, you know, dude, it takes courage to like write books. It takes mm. courage to like put yourself out there. And I never really thought about it that way. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I saw the wisdom of Trent's remarks. And so I bring that up with people too. It's like, you know what? Do you want to cheer from the sidelines or do you want to play in the game? I'd rather play in the game. It seems like you had a sense of naivete towards what writing a book was actually like. I know that you sent out 65 proposals and you got one or two back and your wife was like, you can't just write a book, but you were like, yes, I can. If I say I can, I'm going to do it. So where did that level of confidence come from? So that's a really interesting question. Um, one that I'm kind of doing a deep dive on right now, uh, studying uh, genetic behaviorism, studying uh, cumulative cultural uh, and, and family uh, advancement, et cetera. The honest answer is I, I, I am an insanely lucky human being. Uh, my, the odds against me, I, and, I, and I, like literally every night, I say, thank you, thank you, thank you to the universe. I mean, I, I won the cosmic lottery, man. And, and look, I think anyone who's breathing and above ground you're the result of millions of years of success. 
And and do you know what the odds against you are? I mean, like they're nil. If if we were going to do just do stats, we shouldn't be here. You and I should not be talking. So I think that um, there's there's some interesting theories in psychology um, that are now being kind of um, underlined by uh, the genetic behaviorists. Is that uh, some of this stuff, actually a high degree of this stuff, is being a member of the lucky sperm and egg club, um, and and you know that that kind of sucks when you have to say that, right? Because it's like, oh, but but what about me? I, I you know I. I'm lucky, and 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 I've always been a very um, uh, sort of positive, I can do this type person, and and so the book, right? So it was called Invest Like the Best, and I was out on a walk, and I always carried a tape recorder with me because uh, another thing, if you want some great ideas, you got a phone, you can use that. Uh, take an hour long walk preferably in nature, although Manhattan is a nice place to walk around too, because there's so many stimuli. Um, and, and then just, uh, you're gonna notice, you're gonna start thinking about things and just record them. And so I was out uh, on a walk. I had moved my family from St. Paul to um, Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, <laughs> and uh, against some protestation from wife. Uh, and uh, because, I was learning, I'd already, I formed my first company, O'Shaughnessy Capital Management at age 27. And my clients were here. And plus I, listen, I, I always wanted to live in New York and you know, that's a different story, fun one. Um, but so I came back, looked at my wife and I said, okay, so to have any credibility today, now this is 1992. So got to remember pre-internet, no social media, none, none of that. Um, I got to have a book. And she's like, um, now, now, mind you, my wife graduated summa cum laude with a journalism degree. <laughs> so, so she's like, so she me. wrote the book. <laughs> she rewrote it. <laughs> uh, it's like the old Mark Twain, it, probably really not Mark Twain. I wonder what he actually did say. Not much of anything. Uh, but he had this great quote, which was uh, the, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. So, it, so anyway, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm going to write a book. Uh, okay. Um, what are you going to write a book about? Well, about how to clone active managers by putting their stocks on a database, seeing where they deviate from the market as a whole, the most, and then using that as a factor screen. And by the way, these terms back then, no one was using them. Um, uh, to, you know, you can clone your favorite money manager. She's like, okay, um, sounds kind of technical. And I went, no, no, it's not gonna be technical. And she goes, well, so are you gonna write it? And I went, even then I was, I was uh, legendary in my laziness. And I was like, uh, no, of course not. I'm gonna do a query letter and an outline and see what happens. Um, and she's like, you are a madman. So I went to uh, the local bookstore here in Greenwich, uh, Diane's Books, and uh, bought, every and this is the other thing I do, I'm crazy. It's like, why buy one book of publishers when you can buy the ball? So I put all these books on publishers with their addresses and everything. And obviously an IBM Selectric, I'm typing out, hello, dear blank, um, and sent out 65 letters and waited. And then they started coming in. And you know, we, we lost them in a move and it really bums me out because there was some hysterical replies like, um, do you have any idea who you, who, what we publish? We don't, you know, we don't deign to publish business books. Uh, anyway, so they kept all of the rejections that came really early. Um, and I kept them all uh, just because I got a kick out of them. And uh, my wife is just like looking and then we, you know, with the, I told you so, I told you so. And then on one day, same day, two letters. 
one from Wiley and one from McGraw Hill. Yeah, we want to publish that book. So, you know, I, I guess if we're going to use it to illustrate a lesson, uh, be persistent. Um, and, and, and always ask. It's like one of the things that I have a hard time with is like, ask, ask. I mean, what, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? They'll say, no, you learn something new. That, you know, that person can be excluded from this particular thing you want to do. And, and getting in the habit of asking also requires, in my opinion, it also requires the ability to be absolutely fine with the idea that you know very, very little. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't know is often my, I, I think like if I went and looked at all the times I wrote something or said something in media or whatever, I don't know would probably be my top phrase. And, and when you're comfortable with that, Guess what happens? You you get to ask why, right? Like hey, why 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 are you doing that? <laughs> um, and and you know hopefully learn something. And, and then finally the other thing you get to do is you get to delete bad bad beliefs, right? Like you know there's there's so many. And and if the, the way I always try to frame it is. Think about the smartest person from, I don't know, 300 years ago. The absolute smartest human being on the planet. What he or she knew, what he or she believed is probably 99% wrong. Wow. So why are we any different, right? Uh, it, it's this this idea that we are somehow special, that's bullshit. Now, is cumulative cultural evolution a thing? Yeah. And in fact, I think we're going through this thing I call the great reshuffle right now. And I think there's some amazing things coming out on the other side of it. That's because of cumulative cultural evolution. And by the way, I'm, I'm not saying there won't be problems. I mean, it's like, I'm a, I'm a rational optimist in that I expect lots of problems, but I expect that we will be able to tackle them through discovery, through invention, through uh, synthesis, through you know, lots of things. But the, the, the point is, knowing how little you know is really, it's just, it's such a freeing thing because what happens to a lot of people I think is they become prematurely certain mm -hmm. about everything, right? And 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 they don't even think about where they got a particular thought from, right? It's like many of those thoughts probably came from your friends in grade school, from your parents, from your brothers and sisters, and from media, from whatever, from rock and roll. Um, and if you really kind of do a deep dive which I've done numerous times. There, there are so many ideas out there that are just wrong. And, and you know, it, it, when you yourself are at peace with that, it, it allows you to remain open-minded in terms of, hmm, maybe I should fix that model up a bit, you know? So, Error correction, look, without error correction, we, we don't advance. And fallibilism is basically the idea that even our best ideas have some part of them is wrong. And, and that's the whole scientific method. And you, know, you get into that. And it's like when I hear people say, I believe in science, I want to scream. It's like somebody saying that is selling you something because the scientific method, which I do believe in, is like pure punk rock anarchy. I'm stealing that from Ryan North, I think. Um, you know, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to take your word for it. No, nullius in verba. Take no one's word for it. And, you know, that was the Enlightenment and boom, 
<laughs> look at what we got. Uh, so you just remind yourself constantly, yeah, I'm probably wrong. <laughs> when you say do a deep dive, you do a deep dive on understanding where your thinking has gone wrong. What exactly does that look like? Um, so, uh, let me give you an example. Um, in 1999, this is like, talk about fucking stuff up. Uh, in 1999, I wrote a piece called The Internet Contrarian in April of 1999. In that piece, I said that this is the biggest bubble any of us have ever seen in our lives. Um, 85% of these companies are going to go bankrupt. Even the companies that go on to be winners, and I name Amazon, are going to go down 95% from their current price. Wow. And then what did I do after that? I founded an internet company. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was called Netfolio. Um, and it was basically going to be the first online investment advisor, not broker because it was going to give advice. I actually have a patent sitting back here. Uh, and the, the, the language of the patent is just so funny. I put a thing up on Twitter saying, I can't shake the feeling that I should have done more with this. Anyway, the, 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 the language was something like, uh, James P. O'Shaughnessy has a patent for the distri distribution and fulfillment of investment advice over a worldwide computer network. <laughs> so... So Netfolio <laughs> got funded quickly. Uh, people were fighting to get into it. Um, and, and then I turned down a massive offer from a uh, well-known investment bank at the time. Um, and so the internet collapsed about a month later uh, because of... Uh, uh, Jack Willoughby over at Barron's, who's a, who's a crazy like a fox and a really clever guy, wrote a story called Burn Rate. They've renamed it since if you're searching for it on the internet. I, I, um, but his name is Jack Willoughby. And it was just simplicity itself, man. Talk about a precision needle going into a balloon. All he did was look at the burn rates of all the internet companies and said, this is when they die. Um, so anyway, uh, I made that mistake, should have taken that deal. What, so how do I do a deep dive on that? What I do is I spell out what happened and then I spell out and I have it somewhere here. Actually, I wrote a piece that, uh, I'll, I, I can send you, it's called mistakes were made and yes, by me. Um, and anyway, the deep dive on that was I learned a lot about human nature and how I was as subject to it as anybody else. Thinking that you're exempt from it is a fool's errand because you're not, because we're all running human OS. Um, I learned uh, about the idea of awareness of luck means having the ability to notice the lucky situation and take advantage of it. Not just notice it, but take advantage of it. I learned a lot about the way we, I guess we'd call it mimetic behavior today, but the way that we take on the, uh, our group's beliefs. So the reason I said no to this um, this large investment bank was because my board was made up almost entirely of venture capitalists uh, who were pure internet purists. You're a kid, so you, you wouldn't remember this, but back then, anything that was even remotely, remotely touching bricks and mortar, as they called it, um, was, you know, anathema. Not today, Satan. You know, we're taking over the entire thing. Everything's got to be online. So my board had essentially convinced me, but I'm not going to blame them. I made this decision, right? So this was my error, not theirs. Um, but they convinced me that 
you know, if you really wanted this to be a pure play, it had to remain pure internet. Um, and then, you know, I learned about hubris, um, which is kind of the pride goeth before the fall. I was feeling pretty like much like King shit back then. And um, whom the gods would destroy, they fir first uh, make feel like that. <laughs> because uh, it, it didn't learn. Finally, though, I also learned, and I learned this later, what we're doing right now at OSAM, we call Canvas, which is custom portfolio creation, which is what Netfolio was. We now have the technology. My son, who's run the company for the last three years as CEO and is brilliant, uh, you know, came into the office and said, hey, you know, you made the, these guys, because one of my big things was I, I want, I always used to joke, I want like everything to be tech. I don't, I want to, I want to, I want to have, be the last employee. I want everything just to be technology. Uh, so I, we built amazing technology for asset managers over the last now 12, 13 years. And if we didn't have these component pieces, no canvas. Like I, I see people saying, oh, we're going to do this. And I just smile because man, if you're a tech guy, you know, mad chops on your tech ability, but Asset management is very, very different and requires some like really nitty gritty uh, technology that takes a long time to build. But the point is, he came in and said, Dad, you know, we, we built the Death Star to kill a mouse. Let's 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 create let's let's do a riff and and let's uh, let's take um, the idea of customization and like really, really make it customizable. And I'm like, that's fantastic. So having, having had the idea, right? And, and then having a switched on son who makes the idea 10 times better and, and has technology that really, I, I truly believe this is gonna change the way money gets managed. And it's like, and here's a plug for why you might wanna read old stuff. So like Peter Drucker uh, was a management guru um, back in the 20th century, but his favorite book of mine is called Adventures of a Bystander. And it's about all these really interesting, like really fascinating people he met during his life. And, and one scene, he worked for a, a, what they called a merchant banker um, in the 1930s in London. And I, I, had, I was rereading it and I got like really excited and I called my son. I'm like, Patrick, what we're doing with Canvas is the way they managed money for the super rich back then. It was all done for you. If, if Danny comes in and says, this is what I want, we can do it right down to your every specification. You say you want, I, you know, let's say I've got a lot of sisters, so I want to empower women. I have two daughters, I have two granddaughters. So maybe I want to devote 20% of my portfolio to companies that have 20% or greater women in the C-suites or on the board. We can do it. And, and so this is the way taxes, you got a tax problem, we can manage it. And, and, but the whole point is that what has happened is the technology has enabled a return to this super high touch that that only like the richest people got way back when, and so so the the, the days of one size fit fits all they're done. And look, you know I can just see it now. O'Shaughnessy says mutual funds and ETFs are going away. No, they're not. Obviously not. They serve very very good purposes for if for people with specific goals, right? Um, and it also takes these things a lot longer to, to like present. Um, but th that would be an example, sorry for the long-windedness um, of, of doing a, a deep dive on something I really fucked up. <laughs> well, in that whole deep dive, I really got a sense and an understanding of how deeply in touch with technology, it seems like you are. 
and that's what I'm so impressed with, with you on Twitter. It's like, I'm looking at you and the way you're communicating, the things you're talking about are not the things that you would expect a 61 year old to talk about. And that, I mean, as the highest form of compliment, I, I, because, I, I, because you can communicate with those in your age range and, and above, and you can also communicate with those who are 20 something. And that's incredible. So how do you recommend one get that gift or is it just an, another matter of, of being lucky? So thank you. Um, there's a thing that I call, well, I don't call, it's a well-known concept. It's called beginner's mind. And you can train yourself to have a beginner's mind, which means you, when you come to subjects like tech, for example, um, just kind of treat it like, I know nothing about this. So I'm going to read about that. And I'm going to check that out. I'm going to check that out. Um, so beginner's mind, very helpful because you don't get caught um, in, in like, um, these are my beliefs, God damn it. Uh, because that's not a way to live life as far as I'm concerned. Um, I have always been enamored of technology all my adult life, starting at age 18. I wrote long essays about it, about how it was going to fundamentally transform the world. Um, and, and so I always, always, whatever was new, I wanted to either, if I could afford it, I bought it. If I couldn't afford it, I would go check it out, where, you know, wherever. Um, and I, I love it because I see it as a extension of us, right? Um, it's technology right now is a tool. And I, what I think is so great about your generation, man, is you are going into a world in which the tools at your disposal are like amazing. You want to start your own company? You got everything you need right here. I'm pointing at a at a iPhone, and it can be an Android too. Uh, but but the point is, I just I I'm so excited about where we're going as as a species and you know my son likes to make fun of me and he's like because everyone's talking about the metaverse right now right and he was over for dinner the other night and he's like you know dad i i do tell people that you went into the metaverse back in 1985 <laughs> <laughs> goes, it's true hey, looking hey, look hey. at your twitter it looks like you're you're fully in there <laughs> and uh and uh, so it's just like, I love the, I just love the potential, mm. the, cre the, the creativity that's going to be unleashed with this. Uh, I'm just like massively bullish. Now, that, look, there's going to be problems too. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing a series uh, for my podcast, Infinite Loops, uh, and I, I call it the Great Reshuffle. Uh, other people call it, you know, into the metaverse, uh, you know, Packy McCormick calls it the great online game, mm -hmm. um, you know, lots of different names, but same kind of thing. And, and really, I think that one of the central keys to it is that we have collapsed time, space and geography. Geography doesn't matter anymore. And if you think about that for a while, whoa, whoa, I mean, just think about like, I don't know, let's, let's say that you are um, like uh, a, a fantastic artist and, and you live in a small rural town in Alabama and, and, and you don't have a computer. <laughs> you know, you, you, you can, you, your art might be great, but you're a victim of geography unless you're willing to move. Right. A lot of people aren't willing to move now. They don't have to. Mm. And 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 so on the upside, this is going to open opportunities for. Like hundreds of millions of people in emerging countries, 
Uh, my newest uh, colleague at Infinite Loops uh, lives in India and um, proved his uh, uh, worth, i.e. demonstrated his competence to me by me watching him on Twitter for like seven months. He didn't know I was doing that. What particularly did you notice about his skill set that made you say, oh, I want this person to work for me? He was voraciously curious about everything. He did a really good job of sharing interesting ideas and um, uh, things that people might want to think about. He put together uh, what he calls an anti-library of kind of books that you know you you wouldn't necessarily um, see on a like some uh, flax recommendation list, and and he was just like you know just watching him interact with other people, uh, they always like switched on. Man, he was just like he got it, and so. I, I personally think that Twitter's a Schnelling point. You know what a Schnelling point is? No. Okay. So, so a Schnelling point is a place where absent any other information, we would both think of the same place. So if, if, if you and I were contestants on a, on a, a show and, 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 and the only instruction they gave us was you guys are going to win $10,000 if you can find each other in Manhattan uh, at noon. And that's all. That's all we know. Uh, I've got a picture of you and you got a picture of me. Uh, but they won't tell us anything else. Where would you go? Times Square. Boom. Schnelling Point. <laughs> that's what a Schnelling Point is. It's a place where you're naturally drawn in. And I owe... Uh, my deeper dive on this to my friend Alex Danko, uh, who's my recurring guest on uh, Infinite Loops. Uh, the other one, the clock in Grand Central Station. You know that ball clock, right? Yep. Yep. And and so Times Square, the clock in Grand Central Station, and the Empire State Building. Yep. Those, those, are, the those three are places. Those, those are the three places, man. And so I think Twitter is a schnelling point where. People are gathering, and I, I, I honestly believe that it's the new university. I get teased a lot for saying that, but by who? I, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm not calling out any of my friends. <laughs> my, my, my friend, my friends of mine, uh, uh, who who are like who who are the 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 head shakers as you were pointing out earlier when you know at age 61 it's like when are you going to stop being like a little boy with all of your excitement about everything that's going on i said i hope never i think you figured it out and i i hope to maintain that level of enthusiasm and curiosity into the later years of my life. And hopefully these are just the beginning years of your life with the technology that is existing today and, and that continues to, to elongate our, our lives. So- that's another, Yeah, that's another thing I'm wildly bullish on, by the way. The extension of life. Yeah, I think that, um, and, and, and the improvement in the quality of life. Mm. Um, I think that uh, biotech uh, is, going to have some massive home runs in the next 10 years. Uh, you know, I know that I, let's try to avoid the, and this is another thing that just drives me crazy. How do you manage to politicize a drug? How, <laughs> how do you do that? I mean, like. Or a mask. I, how is a mask or, politicized? I don't understand that. It drives me crazy. It's like. What can we do about that, Jim? Oh, wow. That's a long conversation. We got um, time, thankfully. <laughs> so, so I think one of the, we're talking about the, the great reshuffle and everything. And, and one of the things, if you study history, is that almost all eras um, that produced golden ages were highly chaotic, highly chaotic. And this one is no different. And, and so what 
happens to people is so so you know who Claude Shannon is? No. Okay. So so highly recommend you you figure out who Claude Shannon is. There's a really good movie uh, on him called The Bit Player, which you can watch. Claude Shannon should be as famous as Einstein because Claude Shannon is the reason we're doing this right now. He's the guy who named him Bits and Bytes. He's the guy who came up with the information theory that allowed for us to do this. And he was a delightfully eccentric guy as well. So you're going to like him just for that. But, but so he came up with this idea uh, called the Shannon limit. The Shannon limit is essentially how much information can we human beings take in before it just like starts driving us crazy, right? And I think with what's going on right now, a lot of people are reaching their Shannon limits. And, and when that happens, people seek simple explanations. Simple explanations sounds a lot like a conspiracy theory, right? And, and they naturally fall into this simplification because they're, they're worried that they might be going a little crazy. And, and then add to it the um, ability to sort yourself into whatever tribe you want via social media, right? In group, out group, all of the studies show that this one's wild just to show you how powerful this stuff is. I randomly sort you, Danny, into a in group and let's call it the cool kids, okay? So you're randomly sorted into there. You don't know anybody else in that group. You don't know. They might just be names on a page. You might not even see them as a human being. I give you $100,000 and I say, Danny, you're gonna distribute this. There's the cool kids and then the super cool kids. They're group B, they're the other group. You're in the cool kids group. The super cool kids group is over here. You get to distribute this 10 or this 100,000. You're going to give it all to the people in your group. It's insane. And yet, it, it, you got to understand the way we evolved. You got to understand, you know, uh, it, the hierarchy of the tribe. You got to understand banishment equals death. Uh, so you're going to toe a lot of lines, man, if, if getting banished by your group means you die. So I think what happens is people freak out. They seek simple explanations. Um, some clever propagandist comes up with a, uh, a narrative that sounds right. And, and you buy it, hook, line, and sinker. And then suddenly, you know, Days later, you're on Twitter saying, this is a hill I will die on, and you are a moron if you think that. Ah! <laughs> and it's insanity. It's insanity. It's like, I, I, when, when I was a kid, it was like, you had to get your vaccines. It was, no one was fighting about it or like, whatever. And, and so I just think that this... Have you, have you seen the movie 28 Days Later? No. Oh, you should giving me yeah. so, so many I, resources to check yeah. out after this episode. I, 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 I'm going to have to, I'm going to send you a list, man. Uh, so, tw so 28 Days Later is a horror film, which is good. Uh, but it's basically um, what happens when um, a scientist who've been studying rage uh, get raided by uh, activists and, and release the animals that are filled with rage and they bite humans and guess you can see what happens. And so it's kind of a zombie flick, even though they're not zombies, but they're kind of like zombies. And, and so what happens is you, you, you get into this space where you start attaching these beliefs to yourself and your definition of who you are as a human. And, and so suddenly it's not 
um, what, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, mRNA is good, bad, different, blah, blah, blah. But it is poison that Bill Gates is trying to chip me with. And he's trying to buy all of the farmland and blah, 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 right? And, and on the other side too, right? Like, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, Beetle, Bilberg group runs the world or, you know, the Illuminati or all of these silly things. By the way, another guy, if you want to read, who's got a great sense of humor, uh, humor uh, Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, so a couple of things like this started as gags, right? So, so <laughs> there was this whole religion called Discordianism, which is uh, the worship of chaos. And Eris is the goddess of chaos and, and, and whatnot. Well, people started taking it seriously. <laughs> and like, it became a religion. And then like, uh, you know, they started, they started this wild rumor that the CIA was doing these, uh, these tests with psychedelics and everything until they found out that the CIA was doing tests with psychedelics. Um, and so when there's like a monochrome of truth, right? You, you, you just fall so easily into dogma. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, dogma is the death of thought. And the death of thought is the death of you. And, and so, you know, marry that to people need things to believe in, right? And, and you also have to understand how weird the, the period that we kind of like say, oh, wasn't that great? You know, like post-World War II, right? Between 1946 and 1976, say. And everyone's like, that was normal. Hell no, that was the biggest anomaly of all time. We wiped out all of our competitors. We sold 86% of all the cars built in 1958 because we bombed their factories in the dust. But then we also, rebuilt them as opposed to try to punish them more. So it, and, and then add in the downfall of traditional religion. I'm not a religious person. I'm not an atheist because that would require as much faith and proof as somebody who's like a born again Christian. Um, and well, I have no problem with people of faith and, and what, you know, fine. But the, you know, if I was running a society, those 10 commandments, hmm, I probably would say they came from God too, um, because they're, they're pretty good for, for running a society. And, and, you know, the thing is like, even people have conspiracies about that and it's just not a conspiracy, man. It's just makes sense. It, societies are complex adaptive systems and, and with feedback. And in a complex adaptive system, uh, emerging properties come from the bottom, not from the top. And, and so, you know, I, I, I get a simpler like world, but that was like one big Potemkin village. Like there were three networks. There were two newspapers that mattered. The New York Times, the paper of record and the Wall Street Journal. And there were three networks. And if, you know, Walter Cronkite was one of the most powerful people in the world because if Walter Cronkite decided that something was bad, America decided something was bad. And, and so people yearn for that kind of simplicity. I certainly don't because, well, that was fine if you were a heterosexual white male. It wasn't so great if you weren't and if you uh, were a person of color or you were a whole host of things, you know, uh, that people uh, were very prejudiced against uh, just like really backward attitudes. And, and so we always want to remind ourselves that let's not rom romanticize uh, things. I would, listen, man, I envy you. I envy, my, you know who I really envy? I envy my grandson, Pierce, and my granddaughter, Mae, my granddaughter, Langdon, because they're going to be in such a cool world. They're going to be amazing. 
What do you think that your grandchildren or maybe your grandchildren's grandchildren will think that we, what we are doing today is totally backwards? <laughs> oh, God, where do we even start, right? Um, you know, I think they, they will be flamoxed by these, by people having these crazy wars of attrition with each, with each other and trying to cancel people for ridiculous reasons and ideas. Um, I think that they're going to think we were pretty crazy to wow, this whole period. I mean, my God, they're going to study this and they're going to go, oh man, they were really fucking dumb, weren't they? Um, you know, and, but here's one, right, where, where you could learn something from the way people used to do things and it would have been better. So an example, the CDC comes out originally and says masks don't work. They said that. They tried to deep six it all. They tried to, you know, memory hole it. Surgeon General said that. It's crazy. Course. So, 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 so despite their best efforts to pull a Stalin and erase it all from history, they, they, it's still there. What that's also, the that's also what's so crazy about the internet is like, you can't put that away because the screenshots exist because it actually is there. And so- yeah. Just to continue on your point. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. What, what about a really crazy notion? A really crazy notion that the head of the CDC comes out when this starts, right, back in March of 2020 and says, here's the deal. We think that masks are going to be very effective in uh, preventing the spread of this disease. But we're going to level with you, my fellow citizens, we don't have enough. And we've got to make sure that our uh, healthcare people on the front lines are safe. And so we just ordered a hundred million and they're coming, you know, whenever. But as you, we're asking you as fellow Americans to, to honor this. And, and the minute we get them, we'll distribute, you know, whatever, we'll distribute them free. Your average American, I think, would be like, that's fair. That's fair. I don't think that's unfair. And, and instead, they lie, losing trust, right? And, and then they compound the lie, and then they compound the lie. And, and it's like, ah, you, you, you know, just simple truths sometimes work. And it's like I was talking to a, a a friend of mine the other day, and it's kind of like, you know, we here on the coasts are, in addition to being neurotics and kind of crazy, it's like we forget what like your average real America is like. And now I know I've set myself up for, yeah, they're all dumb or blah, blah, blah. No, they're not. They're actually really chill people for the most part. And, you know, I grew up in Minnesota and you know, I, I, that's if I broke down, if you broke down, if anyone broke down in a car and a, an old beater pickup truck you see in your rear view mirror coming along, it's going to pull over and you're going to freak out a little. <laughs> but then the guy or woman's going to walk up and say, what happened? And you're going to, you know, say, my car broke. Well, I'll help you. And I, I've actually had this happen to me. And they'll not only will they drive you to the gas station, they'll offer to wait and take you back with the gas tank. So I think that this, this kind of intense vilification, you know, the doom machine, the media obviously has decided that this is a good monetary strategy for them. That let's keep everyone terrified. Let's keep everyone filled with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And, and they're, they're setting themselves on fire. And guess what? The best of them are going to get their sub stacks and you and I are going to create our own little newspapers and, and they're going to be fantastic, 
because the writer is getting a fair wage for what he or she is doing. And, and watching this self, this seppuku being done by our mainstream media, it's just, uh, I find it so hysterical. Now, I stopped watching TV news 10 years ago. It's poison. It is poison. And I don't care what team you root for. We're back to that again, right? I don't know. If you're team red or you're team blue, it doesn't matter. They're lying. They're lying. <laughs> they're propagandizing. That's what they're doing. And what, what do you tell someone who's in that machine right now who is who has grown up and they they trusted Walter Cronkite, they trusted a fair and balanced news, and they're still in that system? Is there anything that can be done to be pulled someone out of that, that matrix? Or is it just impossible if someone say like 60 plus or 70 plus? So I don't think it's ever impossible. Um, I think that uh, it takes a lot more work. And I'll use my mother-in-law as an example. She's 94 years old, super bright woman, um, still has every marvel she had when she was born. Um, but her habit was, um, to watch TV news and, um, you know, I get that my parents watched TV news too. I did when I was a kid. Sure. Um, and, and so we have her for dinner. She lives locally here and, and, um, we have her for dinner and like during the whole election thing, uh, you know, um, asking all these questions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm finally like, I want you to do me a favor, Terry. And she's like, what? And I'm like, stop watching TV news just for a week, just for a week. That's all I ask. And, and then let's mark it down. If you'll do that for me, let's mark it down and let's talk about it a week later. And she was like, I can do that for sure. So we had her again and she's like, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> that but is she, wild. But, but, but then she finally did. She did do it. And later she was like, ah, oh, I, 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 I feel like this cloud lifted. Wow. From from my brain, and I, she's she was like kind of flabbergasted. And if you study this stuff, you see that it is a very potent medium, more potent even than social media, because it puts you into a hypnotic state. It is you are passive in watching television. Whereas, when, you know, you and I are talking, we're engaged, we're active uh, on Twitter, you know, you're, you're, you're communicating with people, um, not saying that social media can't be weaponized, it can be, um, but TV, man, whoa, really good. And by the way, you know, pick up the book Influence, um, pick up, uh, there's, there's a whole host of books that are instruction manuals for how to do this stuff. But TV, especially, puts you into a different brainwave pattern, which is you're hypnotized, essentially, and repetition, right? So it's, it's like really simple stuff. Just repeat, 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 repeat. And, and as that happens, it's the way our brains function. By the way, it's not our conscious brain that's getting involved. It's our unconscious brain. And our unconscious brain is the one making most of the decisions anyway, right? Most people make decisions emotionally and then paper them over with, you know, real, you know, rational sounding reasons like, oh, no, I did that because <laughs> no, no, you didn't. You, you, you know, you, you did that because it was an emotion at the time. But if you can, so that, that's a, a simple fix that works for a lot of people. If you can get them, to truly not watch TV news, and I mean all TV news, because inevitably, like when I'm talking to friends about this, they're like, you know, you are so right about Fox, but, you know, PBS does a really good job. And I'm like, no, I'm talking 
all sides. They're fighting propaganda wars. Look at what's going on. Why are they doing it? Follow the money. They're making money. It's like Donald Trump was the best thing that ever happened to the New York Times. They were going broke. And then Donald Trump came along as their savior. If you want a conspiracy theory, there you go. Maybe maybe they slipped him some ownership and they're like, go wild, man. <laughs> you mentioned before about how you stopped watching television 10 years ago. And I'm curious what what you saw. Uh, so, so, sorry, Let, let's, be, let's be careful. I didn't stop watching all television. I stopped watching uh, TV news and I don't watch live television. Gotcha. So you stopped watching TV news around 10 years ago. And I'm curious what you saw that made you say, okay, this is something's off here. If you can recall. Um, I think it was a result of the, uh, the great recession. And um, now that's a, I know, I know a lot of those people who they were having on as guests uh, B, I do know something. I mean, that's what I do. Um, and um, I, I became alarmed with things that I knew were untrue being presented as if they were absolutely true. And that started like really getting me a little crazy. And like, I, I used to like put one of the financial news networks on when I was working on the treadmill. And it's just like, I, I can't remember more, you know, which particular segment it was, but it was, it was something like where I knew like virtually everyone who they were talking about. And I'm like, lie, lie, lie. And, and so I think that that probably was what sparked it. And then I just was like, you know, uh, I, I prefer reading anyway. So I'm just gonna see how that goes. And it stuck. That's really interesting. Cause you have that inside look into the whole process. It is easier for you to identify and then tell that knowledge to other people. I'd like to kind of switch gears here and talk about something you've mentioned before um, that you are referred to sometimes as the calm within the storm, how you are able to keep calm when everything else is going crazy around you. And we've talked about some crazy situations like the Great Recession and COVID in the past year. It's like the ability to stay calm in that scenario is probably the best attribute one could potentially have. So what advice would you have for someone who wants to stay calm in future uncertain terrain, which I'm sure is guaranteed? So I guess the best advice that I could give is to try to unstick yourself from time. Understand that this too shall pass. And gain some perspective by asking yourself like a series of questions. So let's stick with the great financial crisis. And let's say um, you're deciding whether you're going to stay invested or not, or add, add some money to the stock market or whatever your investments. If you can unstick yourself from time and you can understand that this too shall pass, you're far more willing to see situations like say other crashes, the crash of 1987, you know, the, the depression, you know, did we recover from that? I mean, that was wicked bad, man. And we did. Took a long time, but we did. And then if you can understand that it isn't so much the event 
it's your reaction to it. It's your emotional reaction to it. If, if there's nothing you can do, right, um, to, to change a situation, then, then you need to acknowledge that and, and let those emotional feelings go. Now, I, I think that I was kind of tuned up for that because of experiences when I was a kid, my oldest sister died when I was 10 and I kind of had to help out. And I actually had talked to a therapist about it. And she said, you have a crisis personality. And I said, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> and, and she was like, no, 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 no. It means that in a crisis, you go the other way. You get like super calm because she said, probably because of things that you learned, like when you were a 10 year old dealing with your oldest sister dying. Um, and, and so, um, and then just kind of my natural philosophy, which is, you know, there, there, there is precious little on the grand scheme of things that you or me or anybody can like, change and and what there's a great quote um i can't remember whose it is but it's like he who angers you controls you and if i want to manipulate you i want to keep you in a very very agitated uncertain state and again if you if you take a deep breath and think about these kinds of things what will happen is you'll realize that you're like freaking out or shouting or getting emotional or blaming or you know scapegoating, whatever, isn't going to change the situation at all. It's probably just going to make you, you know, like overdose on cortisol and which is really bad for you. And, and so I guess the, the, the deep breath, assess, remind yourself that this is going to pass um, and that, you know, the, the odds favor you waking up tomorrow. <laughs> I think that's a, a beautiful place to bring this conversation to a close, Jim. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it uh i uh i, I don't think so danny I, you, this was fun uh, i didn't uh i didn't uh, anticipate i always like uh uh going into kind of uh these things without like you know knowing what your questions are going to be it's like i i am so the opposite of a control freak <laughs> uh and i just think it's much you, you what happens is that's interesting is you just go interesting places right yeah um, so kudos to you good luck with the podcast how long have you had it this is we're coming up on a year oh and congratulations man that's awesome. 150 episodes what awesome yeah. that's yeah. fantastic good for you man thank you we're rolling and on that topic of of just going with the flow and and seeing where it turns out i think when you're an open book and you're willing to share and you're curious about the world, it presents the best conversations. So I acknowledge you and admire the way you've been able to do that for so long. And I'm really grateful for this episode. Where can people find you further if they want to connect? Uh, well, obviously on Twitter, um, I'm at uh, JP O'Shaughnessy. Um, our website is osam, oscarsam at a mary.com. Uh, uh, the podcast is uh, at infiniteloops.com. It's available on every podcast platform and YouTube and, and everything else. Um, and then, then you will be entirely sick of me. So uh, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> we'll put all those below. Thank you, Jim, for your time. I really appreciate it. All right. It. Cheers, man. Thank you.